Okay. Um, welcome to the February 2024 ILL Roundtable. You can't see it. I'm very excited that I remember to say the right year because that's the first time that's happened. <laughs> um, so the agenda for this meeting is pretty brief. We only had a couple of items. Um, one of them was to review some of the suggestions. Can you hear the blaring in the background? Oh, oh good. Okay, oh. so the noise cancellation is working. <laughs> They're testing the sprinkler system today, oh. so you might see flashes. Um, so the first thing on the agenda was to review some of the suggestions that have been sent in for changes to the best practices document. Um, I thought we could start the review process and we'll do the official updating of best practices in May so that it's on the regular update the document schedule um, so that we can issue a new one after every May meeting. So an annual review seems like a pretty good schedule for that document. And then I also wanted to do a brief review um, and demo of the participant record in Clover because there's been some questions about some of the settings. So I thought just having everyone together to go over it and um, check out the different fields and what their purpose is would be a great just thing to add to the meeting. Um, I didn't receive any other agenda suggestions. So after those two things, we'll just open it up for any discussion. Um, I could start the ball rolling with the, I have two things that have been um, asked. No, three, no, I am correct. Two things that were suggested to add to best practices. One you might have seen on the listserv, and that was a lot of talk about um, requests for new items, and that some people have been sending out requests to borrow new items the day that item is published, which is a problem because a lot of libraries are still processing, mm. processing the book at that point. So one of the suggestions was going to be that adding to the best practices document please don't request a new title until it's been out for 30 days. It's kind of an arbitrary guideline, but I figure that amount of time would give people a chance to process the book, add it to the collection, and see if their patrons want to borrow it. I know some libraries don't lend until it's six months, but um, some libraries will lend new items. So I thought maybe that was a good balance and i was wondering if anyone had any feedback or suggestions for that one yes uh the name on your your raised hand is cindy smith no i'm not cindy smith no <laughs> okay I, i'm wrong I, I had to i i have levels here at alice ward in canaan uh our policy has been six months but mm -hmm. we can also we can also adjust that too because uh, a lot of new books that like uh, the popular authors they go fast and we give them about six months but that may be a little long and we may have to adjust that. I mean, and you don't have to adjust that. Um, I libraries have control over their lending policies and six months is fine. The the thirty days is more so that people who are sending out requests for brand new right. items will at mm -hmm. least give libraries a chance to finish processing before they send requests. Yeah. Very good. Susan. I was wondering, could you put that reminder right on the request form? You know, I don't know if I can, but I can look into that. I mean, one of the problems is sometimes whoever is doing the request really isn't up on what's new and may not realize that sometimes we get requests for books that aren't even out because they've heard it on NPR or whatever. I heard that too. That's a great idea. I'm going to check with Autographics and see if I can add that in somewhere. That's fantastic. Um, 
Anybody else? Okay, um, and does everyone agree that putting the guideline in the best practices of please don't request a new book until it's been out for 30 days to allow time for processing and um, local patrons to opt in on it? Do you think it should be more time, less time? Yes, one raised hand. Cat suggests at least 30 days. Okay. All right, so I will mark that one down and we'll do the final review of, we'll do a solid re complete review of the best practices in May, but I will put that on there to add to it. Okay, and the other one that I received was asking to clarify that if an item is lost, oh, sorry, Susan, your hand is up. Sorry, just going back to the best practices about removing paperwork if we add it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I leave mine on. I don't follow that best practice because I feel like if it gets lost, there is documentation of when it was sent, who it came from, and where it was going. Mm hmm. A lot of that is also contained within the Clover system as well, which is why some libraries don't send the paperwork. But if it goes to the wrong library, they don't have access to that information. So if it gets delivered to the wrong library or if I put it in the wrong bag and it ends up at the wrong library, um, they do have access if that paper cover is still on. Mm hmm. That's good. I know. And on the best practices, we do have um, the suggested information to include when lending is the due date, the request number and the borrowing library or a checkout slip as well. And I haven't noticed any significant increase in that happening. Okay. Sorry, if I'm looking away, it's because I'm making notes. I am not ignoring the meeting. Okay, so maybe the next time I send out the best practices, since we send it out every six months on the ILL listserv, I can make sure to highlight that specifically. Okay. A little bit, and then we'll see if the I get the workflow going. Well, okay. Josh. Thanks so much for making time for this. Hi. Hi. Um. <clears throat> sorry. I was just wondering if there's any ever like any discussion about doing away with paper altogether because we can just type in a title you know we can like it's pretty easy to go into clover and you know search for things there there has been discussion about doing away with paper um it 
with the last round table talked about it. And there are some libraries that are part of the sustainability initiative and they have cut down on paper. Some of them have eliminated it entirely. Um, right. But it's been some libraries making small steps, but other libraries have specific systems that work for them. And so there has not been any like blanket statement of stop using paper just because depending on the library, that's the process that works best for them. Oh, okay. um, and Kat point out in the chat that typing in the title really only works for those handling small amounts of items. Um, that is true because if you're in Clover, like when I go into the out of state account, which handles hundreds of requests every week, um, it, it takes a good amount of time for that search by title option to finish loading. Um, uh. Yeah. It used to break. They had to do some coding in the background because it, other libraries were running into that, too. Oh, um, and Kat also pointed out that it adds a lot of computer and work time for smaller staff who are doing large amounts of items if things aren't labeled, yeah. which is why we came up with that, um, you know, include a checkout slip if your system has it or just this like three things of who it's going to and when it's due and the request number if if you can just to make it yeah. easier on the people who get like three bins of stuff a day right yeah i just i've always been curious about that because it just seems so random sometimes there's nothing sometimes there's like too much information in a way exactly it's yeah. and part of it is because every library has their own their own system of doing it and their own settings um yeah. I and yeah, I can't actually so it, tell anyone to do this, but I, that's why we have the best practices. So it's a solid recommendation. You mean recommendation to use the uh, the paper printout? Yes. Okay, that's what especially I for items going through the courier, just in case they get missorted or mislabeled. Right. Right. But okay, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And Kat says that request numbers are the best, especially when they're scannable barcodes, which is something that happens if you use the Clover book straps. It'll print it as a scannable barcode. I also love those um, because that's what I use for item numbers in the temporary records in our ILS. Eric. Oh, you're muted. Or you're not, we're not hearing anything. Let's see. You're not actually muted. I just can't hear you. <laughs> oh, come back to you. OK. Um, but yes, I think, um, Josh, you're right that sustainability is a thing. And cutting down on paper usage is something that's on the mind of a lot of libraries. And I think some are taking small steps and I'm seeing, you know, less paperwork from some places and um, depending on the library, sometimes there's extra paperwork, but it varies so much. And then you add in the out of state libraries and their different approaches to paperwork. But uh, yeah, I wasn't arguing one way or the other. I was just curious right. about and I know that, I mean, it's like everything, like, you know, <laughs> everything varies from library to library, so. Local control, even over That's the right. paperwork. <laughs> That's right. But yeah, I'm going to add that as a reminder. Um, okay. Let's see. Oh. Uh, Eric says... I was going to say that it feels to me like a nice balance to do a checkout slip with the request number written on it as a way to use less resources, but still have the relevant information. And that's great. Um, I, I think that's a really great approach, especially if your system will print out the checkout slips. We don't have a checkout slip printer, so we don't include that. But this does remind me that I should look at our own process and make sure that 
we are following the best practices. Um, but yeah, I, I also think that's a great balance. Okay. Let me, all right, let me circle back to the best practices suggestions that I've been receiving. Um, the second one that I received was um, asking about replacement copies. Um, some libraries have been getting replacement copies without being able to send an invoice or getting any kind of communication. So I didn't know if we should add something to best practices that if a loaned item is lost, you should contact the lender before doing anything else to see, A, if they will accept a replacement copy, but also to make sure you're getting the exact same thing that was lost and that you're not about to send them a paperback copy when a hardcover copy was lost. Um, so I didn't know if anyone had either suggested language for that or if you think that needs to be in best practices. What do you think? What what is the uh, what's the best practice now, like as it stands now? It or doesn't it doesn't actually have anything addressing lost items. Oh, okay. Hence the question. Yes. <laughs> I'm I'm hoping you can't hear that alarm. I don't hear anything. Okay. Oh, one hand is up. Hi. Hi. Hi, it is. Um, we ran into this problem before with uh, lost books, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes they're older copies. And when my Cindy goes to order them, instead of mm -hmm. hardback, hard, hard covers, they come back paperback, which I'm sure is disturbing to other libraries because they probably want a hard, hard copy of it. Uh, so I, I think we we'll have to work on that a little bit uh, better because we we don't have many lost books, no. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, Sometimes you have to go through Amazon or something to get it. Whoop, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's my time's up. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's the way you cut it off. Uh, but I think I think we'll have to work a little harder on that, too, because sometimes it's very hard to get an extra copy of hard hardcover versus paperback. Mm -hmm. I think in that situation, you would just want to check with the lending library to make sure and say, we can't get a hardcover one. Mm -hmm only paperback is available. So I think it's just a level of communication. Okay, that's, that's a good idea. Okay. Yeah, that's happened with me before. That another library had to replace a book and ask if a paperback was okay. I mean, sometimes it's not possible to, you know, depending on the book, if it's an older, especially if it's an older book, it's not possible to get hard cover, so. So yeah, communication, definitely. Okay, so maybe I will rework my sentence. Um, Kat said they always, they always like to communicate with both the borrowing library and their acquisitions folks to see what works best for both. So yeah, definitely the communication. Um, and Riley says there can be a disconnect when it comes to replacing at Burnham. Um, once they decide that something needs to be replaced, Riley doesn't handle invoices or replacement copies. So that can also be where the that disconnect happens. Um, I think it's just going to be needing some extra communication. Or if um, when you put in an order for a replacement, is there a place to add this is for a replacement and it has to be this format? I know that we had to replace a book um, and I had to email the lender and ask for the specific ISBN and what their what format their record uh, showed because I wanted to make sure we got the right one. And then when I passed it on to the people who actually 
ordered it, um, I said it needs to be this format because this is what we lost. Um, oh, Riley says we try to emphasize just paying the invoice instead of replacing a new book. I think it depends on the on the book. If it's, I mean, sometimes lenders want the invoice paid. They don't want a replacement copy. And then sometimes there's processing fees that are added on that are eliminated if you get them a replacement copy instead. Uh, Kaz says it sucks when we have agreements with other institutions that demand certain formats or editions of things. And that could be hard when you have like an older item too and you can't find that format or edition. Um, but do we think it's, do you think that adding, oh, Susan said, check with loaning library before paying for or replacing a lost item. Yeah, that's perfect. I'm going to put that in there. Um, and Kat said, amusingly, we try to avoid invoicing because we have so little control over that money and it's way more expensive than just getting a replacement copy and walking it down to be processed. I will fully admit I try to avoid invoicing as well because we have to loop in an entire other state department to send the invoice and then I have no way of accessing the finance system to track if it's been paid or where it went. Um, Noreen says that her boss wants an invoice from the other library in order to pay for it. Yep. Um, I did have ours, the one that we lost, send us an invoice. Um, and then I used that as also um, leverage to emphasize why we should just buy a replacement copy because it saved us money to do that. Yes, Kat says yes to all of that, April. Same. I'm pretty sure that the academic institution and the state government is set up with many, many divisions that do different things. And then you can't always access all the systems. Um, Eric points out often quality of backstock items that are purchased as replacements are highly variable, like buying something from Amazon and not knowing how beat up it's going to be. Also a really good point. Um, I think that a lot of times when I get invoices from places that say they will accept a replacement copy, there's always like a clarification of it needs to be a new copy. It can't be used. It, um, and I suspect part of it is because some of them received replacement copies that had like scribbles or highlights in it. Okay. So I'm going to go with communicate with a loaning library before paying or replacing a lost item. Because their internal policies will need to be followed. Okay. I like that. I'm the wrong spot. Okay. So those were the only suggestions I had for modifications to the best practices document. Um, if anyone has more, we can talk them out. We can review them. You can email them. I set the May meeting aside to add these in and then review the document as a whole as well so that we can have a, a longer discussion about it. Um, and this is also good advance notice to think about anything that you want added to that document and to review it as well. So unless anyone has more that they want to suggest a discussion of now, um, if you do have more that you want added, another option is to email them to me and I can include them in the next agenda ahead of the May meeting. And that gives people time to think about them and add feedback as well. I put that in my notes so I remember to tell everybody.
Okay. Um, Tracy said, sorry, they were a little late. We did we already discuss did we already discuss using Clover barcodes versus the lending library barcodes? We talked about that a little bit in the last meeting. Um, we have not talked about that yet. And I know that some libraries have been using when you check an item out or in in your library system, you've been using the barcode um, that came on the book, which is a problem when you're in a shared catalog, because then when you go to check that item in from your patron, it checks it in and it shows as available at that library and then they can't find it because it's still in um, in transit. I know that the last meeting we talked about it um, and it was included in the recording for that meeting, but we have not talked about that for the best practices, partially because it's consortia specific. But let me add that in here. So, um, for phrasing that, I struggled a little with that one. Um, instead of phrasing it as checking in items owned by other libraries before returning in Clover, we could just say, do not use the lending library barcode in your own ILS, especially if it's a shared catalog, unless anyone has a more concise way of Summarizing that one. Please use the Clover barcodes. That works. How about please use Clover barcodes or your own institution's temporary barcode? Yes, Riley's got a temporary barcode. Yeah, it does make those request numbers super easy to find, Cat. Definitely. Okay. That's good. I like that. Okay. Yes, and Kat said if you use them as a barcode to circulate the item as well, which is what we do. Although I don't have a scanner at my desk, so I just type in the, the number, but it's still a nice short number. It's shorter than the barcodes. <laughs> okay, um, and Riley asked if, have we heard of improvements with courier labels and missorted books? It is slow but steady progress there. Um, for a while, I was sending a every other week report on miss sorts. Um, and so Jeff has been doing some retraining in the warehouse and checking in with the sorters. I have been getting less reports of miss sorts over the last few weeks. Noreen says they got one miss sorted book yesterday. If everyone keeps emailing me when they are receiving them, um, it really helps because then we pinpoint which bins are being missorted. Noreen says it's gotten better. Riley. I just had a quick question about that because sometimes when I'm processing the books, I'll see with the courier labels there, maybe I got, you know, it's like it says Burnham, but then underneath mm -hmm. it, it says maybe Fletcher free, but then it says maybe a totally different library. Sometimes there are like stacks of different libraries within my career little window. So I'm oh. just curious if other people, if something is missorted, do, I didn't know if some people might leave that in there to say, yeah, it went to, you know, wherever before it came to you. I just wasn't sure. Or if maybe somebody just had like accidentally grabbed more but sometimes i'll have two totally different parts of the state like in my little window oh. if that makes sense yeah people should be pulling out old labels we did i sent out a reminder about um 
you know, putting in just your label. If you have the return label in that little window, put it face down because otherwise there's that label slide slide around and um, when they're glancing at it, they might see the wrong bin code. So I hadn't heard that there were some floating around with multiple labels, but that could contribute to miss sorts. Okay. Because I did get an email from the courier asking me about the ones with multiple labels. Kat says that she's also seen little windows with stacks of different slips. Yeah, if you're sending out a book, please take the old slips out. Don't just add more on top. The most that should be in there are two labels, which is the library it's going to, and then face down your library, if that is how you like to send the labels back. Um, generally, when we get them, we just the first thing I do is pull all of the labels out of the bag. And that way they're ready to just grab and put new labels in. Um, and Susan asked how many of those reported lost books have ever been recovered? Some of them. There are some that have been floating around missing. I have one from July and at least a few from November. Um, I had the warehouse scanned and the bins are emptied when the, I, when the delivery is made. So it's possible that it's just floating around on a desk. I'm not sure where they've gone to. So I, I, they were either missorted or mislabeled and may just be waiting to find their way home. But generally, the ones that I have um, that are missing, which I also report missing books to priority and ask them to do bin sweeps to make sure it's not lost anywhere. So some of them have been recovered and some of them have not. I have not done an actual, what I would like to do is do a report of um, how many items have been lost in comparison to how many have gone through the system, because overall... Mm -hmm. I think it's low, but I would still prefer there be, you know, maybe two in a year. But I would like them to show up because I don't know where they go once they disappear. Um, although it does remind me of the, I don't know how many people saw this on the listserv, but Maria Warren was tracking that one book that she sent in Vermont and it ended up in New Mexico. <laughs> and then bounced around New Mexico and then it came back. Um, but yes, if you do have outstanding missing books, can um, can you send me a new list and then I can dig into them even more? Um, missing books, miss sorts, all of it helps me and all of it helps the vendor fix any internal problems that might be going on. I, Marie, so I know I should have taken that left turn at Albuquerque. I know. <laughs> oh, that was good. That book went on an adventure. And Kat said, the beautiful thing about ILL is the departments across the country and worldwide are pretty awesome about sending things home. They are. The only time I get nervous is when I get that little envelope from the postal service that just has a mailing label and a we're sorry message <laughs> i don't where did it go <laughs> we care about your package yes enough to give me my address label back oh um but yes if you have anything that is still missing um after months tell me and i will i will recheck with priority we can have a new scan done um but yes we will see what we can do unfortunately there's only so much that we can do after checking the listserv and the bins um i do know that if labels fall out of the bags they sort them into our bin and we get them and i check um okay and i check in clover to see where it's supposed to go when we relabel 
Uh, Eric said, on the note of slips, is it appreciated to write the sent date on the courier tag as a way of tracking the item from sent to received? It can be. It depends on if you're tracking your own. Um, it's not required. The courier had us doing it for a while because back in, I think it was August, there was just this big delay in how things were going. And so he had us, maybe it was the August before, but when that, when it happens and there are large delays in delivery, something's going wrong in the sorting. And so he had us doing that to help figure it out. So I know they made internal changes in the sorting process. They've added a quality control check that is supposed to happen before any bin even leaves the warehouse. So that's helping cut down on the missorts as well. But you can still write the scent date. It's just it's not required at this point. If we have another wave of delays, then I may end up asking people to do that again, because that also gives me solid data to report back. I've, I've never had a vendor who's so happy to receive this pile of complaints where I'm like, I we like this service. This is what's going wrong. And he says, OK, give me all the data. So, yeah. One less step in the process is always appreciated. It is. OK. So. The only other thing I have on my agenda is that um, the participant record. I wanted to just do a brief review of it. I know that I have a tutorial on YouTube for it, but a live demo never hurts. And that way you can ask me questions as we go through. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to share my screen. Um, I do have two screens, so you will still be able to ask me questions and I can check the chat as well. Give me a second to juggle everything. OK, does everyone see my my screen, my Clover window? Yes. Yes. OK, so for anyone who has not accessed the participant record, when you log in, you will not actually see these. You will need to click staff dashboard in the upper left window and then the ILL admin menu. And if you go down under lender, you will see the participant record. If you use quick links over here, you can click this lovely little plus sign and it will put it in your quick links if you ever want to get there much faster. So in the participant record is basically the information that helps Clover run the way it does. What you'll have is your library code, which is your Clover code, um, your library type. You will have your days to respond. And the days to respond is tied to days requests are processed. The days to respond is the number of days that a request will sit with your library. And it will sit with, it doesn't say this here, and I wish it did, it will sit there for the number of days that your requests are processed. So if I say sit there for four days, I want four days to answer an interlibrary loan request. And I have four days checked off down here on as the number of days that we process requests. Then it will sit here, it will arrive on a Monday, and if I ignore it forever, which would be very rude, but if I ignored it forever, it would again leave on Thursday and just move on to the next library. It will sit there for four days. If I only process them on a Monday and a Thursday, it will sit there for two Mondays and two Thursdays. It will sit with me for two weeks. Oh. So when it says days to respond, what it actually means is days that you are processing requests to respond um, or in a in a much more concise way. There's probably a nicer way to summarize that. So what I ask people to do is to look at the days that you process requests and make sure that your days to respond matches that. And that way, even if you are running a little behind or 
you're on break and you forgot to set the holiday dates, your the request will not sit with you forever longer than one week, which is plenty of time to um, respond. So that is why ours is set as four days to respond and we process four days a week. That's um, like the number one change I ask everyone to make sure of. The next section is lender list. So the preferred lender list is where you would put, if you are on the courier, it's where you put the courier library codes. I send out a new list every time we add libraries. Uh, it does not automatically update. So you do have to log in and paste that new list in. And it's pretty easy, you just highlight it, delete it, and then right click and paste. The next section is the system wide list. You can't actually make any changes to that one. It shows up and you can scroll through, but you can't take anybody in or out. Um, and it's just every single library in the entire state. Um, what the system is going to do when you make a request is it's going to check every library that is linked into Clover and it will search by ISBN for a book. And then it will make your request and move all of the libraries that are on your preferred lender list to the top so that your requests, if you are on the Clover or on the courier system, will go to the courier libraries first. And if they do not have it, then it moves on to other libraries in the state. But I feel like I should announce, but wait, there's more. There is the blocked lenders list. And that will give you an additional level of control over where your requests go. I have available by request, I don't send it out on the listserv, a list of lenders that are not on the courier system. And so if you pasted that into this field, then it would send, it will build a lender list only of the courier libraries. So that when you send a request out, if it's owned by someone who is not on the courier, it will actually not go to them. So uh, every once in a while, we went, run into the problem of someone saying, well, I'm trying to request from, you know, the Castleton University library. It's available there, but my request isn't coming through. And it's because you're using the blocked lender list. So if you wanted something and it's not owned by a courier library, you would have to take the blocked lender list out, send that request, put it back in. The time that I have seen the blocked lender list used the best is if someone is sending out um, book club requests and they want multiple copies because the book club requests will um, split all of the courier libraries across the multiple requests. But sometimes one request, it'll run through all of the courier libraries and none of them have it available. And then it'll move on to ones outside of the courier, but maybe those lenders were um, on another list, but it, that on another request, but that request did not get to them. So I've seen this used so that the only courier libraries are added to the requests, which works out pretty well sometimes. Um, Susan asked, where does the latest greatest courier preferred list live? So I can compare and make sure I have the updated one. Um, it lives on my shared drive and was sent out in the listserv, and I am happy to send it to you. Let me make a note so I don't forget. Okay. All right, I will send that to both of you. <laughs> okay, we also have these additional two fields, which is primary default lender and secondary default lender. You can absolutely ignore secondary default lender. We do not have one in Vermont. Um, for primary default lender, you should all see VSS if you ever want items to, can you send it to all of us, please? I can send it out on the courier listserv again. Yeah. 
Um, if you ever want your request to, um, all right. To go out of state, then you need to have the default lender listed. Um, so what you would want is just to, to make sure that you have VSS on yours. We don't have it in this one because it's, uh, it's our account. So if I needed something from out of state, I would just bounce between accounts, um, which is probably I should set it up so that it goes the correct way. Um, but yes, you can put VS, make sure VSS is in there because if you did not want something to come from out of state, there is on every request that yes, no, do you want this to go out of state? Um, just so that if it comes to us and you didn't want it to go out of state, you could put no in there and we will say, no, we will not send it out. We check that on every single request. Okay. Here is a bunch of, let me make this font bigger, actually. There we go. Okay, so the next one is notes. I will fully admit I don't entirely, oh, Josh just said priority just arrived and had no miss sorts. Hmm. <laughs> That's great news. Um, I'm going to fully admit I'm not entirely sure what this notes field does because I have not figured out where it shows up yet. So I generally just ignore that one. Um, there are some yes, no options. There is move request with patron note to awaiting approval, which means that if your patron has submitted a request and they added a note, generally every patron request goes to awaiting approval anyway. So this way, if they've added a note, I think that's for the people who don't have it set up that way. In Vermont, when we set up the patron type, it was set up so that all patron requests go to awaiting approval. So none of them have automatic approval unless you've gone into that specific account and said that they don't need automatic or said that they can just have automatic approval. Okay. The next one is move requests with volumes needed note to awaiting approval. It's pretty self-explanatory if you have someone who is looking for specific volumes and that field is filled out in the request, you can have it moved to awaiting approval so that you can clarify before it goes out. We do not have that set. Now we have allow retry as borrower, which will allow you to retry items that you have requested. Um, we have that set as yes. I'm not sure why you would have it set as no. And then automatically resend requests and retry, which means that if you have sent out a request and it has gone through all possible lenders and then it comes back and it's still unfilled, if you have this set as yes, it's going to just keep rebuilding a new lender list and keep going out. Um, if you would really like to annoy your fellow librarians, you can probably just set that as automatic. I recommend against it so that you can look at the request and see why it was marked as will not supply. Um, it may be one of those ones that you know was published one day ago. So I recommend reviewing the history of a request if it ends up in retry and not just automatically sending it back out. Okay, and now we reach the checkbox portion. Um, accessing ILL request, staff, patrons. Um, we don't use the institutional one. Guests, guests require logins. Um, currently we have it set so just staff and patrons can. If you allow, um, I'm, I'm not sure why anyone would allow a guest to make a request that you would want them to be a patron and log in. Um, oh, so Riley asked when an item is marked as retry, do we need to create a new request? Um, always confused when one of the options is approved. Sometimes you do and sometimes you do not. So if you look at the history down at the bottom of the request, it's going to tell you why an item went into retry and sometimes it's going to vary depending on what the lending library chose as an option. If they put you know, policy problem, and in brackets, it says unfilled. 
it won't go back to them. If they put in, you know, policy problem on display, retry, it's going to depend on what the, re- the reasons why it was turned down. Um, there is also a rebuild lender list, which will then rebuild the lend button. I forgot the word button. It's a rebuild lender list button, um, which will rebuild the lender list for that same request using the same request number, and it's going to pull in the lenders that gave a reason that allows a retry. So if you look at the reasons why it was turned down, then that will give you an idea of if you should use that same request or if you should look for a different record to pull from. I usually end up rebuilding the lender list and sending it out again. You just do approved send. But generally, once something hits retry or unfilled, you kind of have to take it on a case-by-case basis. Your hand is up. Yes, Riley. Oh, I just realized my mic was on, too. Sorry. Um, (laughs) I was just looking at my, like, an example currently. So I requested 20 books of the measure, and three of them went into retry because it said the title is available at other Vermont locations. Please search and request again using a different record. So in that case, when in it's case, in retry, it's not like I can just say, yes, retry. It means I need to create a, a whole nother request. Is that right? That one, I would recommend it. Did it go to did it go to other libraries before it went to VSS? Yeah, I think it's because these three, maybe these three copies were checked out. Yeah, yeah. So, so I received 17, but these three weren't available. And then mm-hmm. I, I know it's probably annoying for people to get like the same request again, I, if, if that makes sense. So like if it's still available in in the system, then um, it will go back to those people who maybe didn't put a specific reason for why. they Is, is that right? Um, if they chose a, an unfilled reason then mm-hmm. no, it will not go back to them. Okay, okay. But also if they did check it out and send it, then it won't go back to them either because it's checked out in their system. <clears throat> but yes, so I know Book Club Books, it always gets tricky because it also takes all of the lenders and splits them across all of the requests. So it's possible that even using the same record, it might pull in other libraries from the preferred lender list that those other requests just never made it to. Because once it's filled, it stops sending that specific request. So there might even be more um, libraries in state that are an option. So you could try with the same record, um, but you might want to start a new request instead. So I'm sorry. So with the same record, because the options are retry, approved, send, delete or cancel so if you put it as retry does that mean it's gonna um send it's gonna it to stay the, it's gonna send it should rebuild the lender list is there a button on the screen that says rebuild lender list next to the lender list yeah spot? yeah i would try that okay because i've always been like if i if i leave it as retry is it gonna stay in that retry section and not actually move or do anything until you leave the status as retry yes you would need to change it to approved send got it got it okay thank you yeah okay um back to our check boxes there is the show blank ill form um here we only have that available for staff because we do not have um patron initiated requests if we wanted our patrons to be able to to use the blank ILL form, we could check that off. If you do not have it checked off for staff or patrons, this link up here will just not show. Um, Show request this button. We have it set to show for staff and patrons. If you allowed guests to make requests, you could check that off. Um, Again, I I would not. And show availability to staff, patrons, and guests. That means when you search, it will tell you, yes, this is available at this library. Um, You can hide that for guests. You can hide that for patrons. It is not connected to the request this button. So even though guests, 
like just general people, anyone searching our Clover um, will be able to see that this is available. They still can't request it. And then for those with patron accounts, show item due date to patron, you can say yes. If you wanted your patron's due date to be different than what the lender has it set as, this is where you change that. It's patron's due date is, and you can set it any number of days prior to the lender due date. I've had a couple of questions about that, and this is the setting for it. And then that is connected to use holiday list. Actually, that is not connected to this. Use holiday list in calculating patron's due date. Um, that one is connected to your own policies. If you say an item is due back in 35 days, which would be a very short lending period, 35 days, but you're on vacation for five of those, it's going to bump that due date out so that it's not due back when you are closed. And we have this as no, um, because we still get three courier deliveries and we get mail delivery, whether we are here or not. Um, show patron willingness to pay message is if it's, you know, how in some interlibrary loan systems, it'll say we'll pay this maximum fee. Ours is always set to zero for out of state. We only request from free lenders. Um, if it's not available at free lenders, then we will check with you before we ask if your patron is willing to pay the lending fee. Um, this one, we just have it set to show up right on the request form. We don't actually put anything in that field, but you could if you wanted to. And then there's also patron payment options if you wanted to add those in. In Vermont, we... Um, we are not charging each other for interlibrary loans, so we don't put anything in there. You can ignore this one because we do not have the NSIP fun function. Um, blank request, disable availability is going to be the same as hiding it. If you unchecked all of the boxes on the show blank ILL form, it would hide it from here. If you disabled it entirely, it would also take it out of the ILL um, admin menu. Oh, and Kat said some bigger lenders are very obnoxious and charge for processing on all ILL requests. Looking at you, Harvard and Yale. I did say some mean things about Harvard when I wanted to borrow something there. Their fees are huge. Um, display history information. Display history information. When you're looking at a request um, and that history is at the bottom, this just is showing how it appears. We have it set for newest first. If you want to see where it started and then travel down to where it went, you can arrange it so it shows oldest first. And calculate renewed to date. This one is important if you do not approve a renewal or reject. Well, and yes, in this case, approve a renewal when it comes in. You can set it to either add to the original due date, which if you're adding two weeks to a book that is already three weeks overdue, it's still going to give them a due date that was a week ago. If you add it to the accept renewal date, then it will add on two weeks from the day that you said, yes, we will approve this. Or I'm using two weeks. It will add however many you have it set as. There is the any addition is acceptable checkbox on the request forms. Um, we have that defaulted as yes. If you ever want a specific addition of an item, you're going to have to uncheck that. But generally, we, um, we, we don't really care what edition it is. Sometimes when it's like a very specific historical book, I will have a patron who does, and then you just uncheck that box. Customer field six on request form checked as default. Um, I have asked them about that. I'm not sure what the customer field six on the request form is, but we have it set to be checked by default. Um, shipping label default. 
we have ours like when you click on print shipping labels there is the both shipped and returned or you can do those in ship status only if you want to print the ones that are shipped and returned in the same place you can do that um, if you only want to see the ones that you are sending out you can just check it over there hide patron data on shipping labels that is a yes that should always be a yes um, and show patron note to lenders is a no. And again, for patron privacy, that should always be a no. Um, display the ILL lender to patrons or guests. I'm not sure why ours is set as no. You, you can set it as yes, and that will also show your patron where their request came from. Allow patrons to change the need by date. I actually said ours is no. I don't, we don't do patron initiated uh, requests, but if we did, I don't want them to change the need by date. And that is the need by date for your request. And you can still change it as staff, but you can set it as yes or no if the patrons can, unless they understand that the um, request will stop moving through the system on the need by date then I would not allow them to change it because otherwise you may end up having them say, well, I want it tomorrow and they'll set it for tomorrow and it'll go to one library and then they'll come in a week later and say, where's my request? I wanted it a week ago. Um, oh, and Susan said that she wishes there was an option to print shipping labels for Will Supply. I also wish that and I have asked for that to be a feature and with any luck when they update some of their interfaces this year that will be something they add in um cat agrees they would like to print book straps for ease of picking items up at the college but clover doesn't allow that yes yep i agree these are all things that have been passed on as feedback and requested as feature changes okay allow patrons to change pickup location we only have one pickup location, so that is set as a no. Um, number of copies default. Uh, we leave that blank for the multi-copy form because it's probably going to change. You have the same field for the blank request form because if you need multiple copies of something from out of state, you can use the blank request form and you can put in the number of copies needed. Um, number of lenders to print per request. You can set it as five. If you're printing out a copy of the request, you can set it to zero, you can set it to one. You could set it to all. That's going to be a lot for some of those requests though. So you can set that amount to whatever you would like. And set default need by date. System-wide, it was set as 90 days. I have rarely seen it take that long to fill a request. Sometimes it does from out of state, depending on how many places it has to go. Um, the minimum need by date is 20 days from the date of request. So I have had um, some places put it as a week out and then ask me why it was never filled. And it was because it went to two libraries. So um, you can... Play around with those, but I generally do, don't change the need by date. And enable checking for duplicate requests. If you have had some items that accidentally go through more than once, you can enable that and it will tell you you already have a request for this. It may create a very annoying pop up if you are doing multiple copies for a book. Um, the time zone adjustment is there because the company is actually based in California, so they move everything three hours so that our timestamps actually match the East Coast. And then the owned by my library, um, show the owned by this library notification message. It will show if you try to request something that is already in your catalog as owned. It will match it by ISBN number, not by title because titles will vary sometimes. Okay. ILL request form patron notices. Um, if you have a form for your patrons to fill out, this is where you can make a custom notice for them. Um, 
we have one, we don't use it because again, we we're not set up for patron initiated requests yet. But if you are, you can make a little disclaimer note like this one that says we will do our best to fill your request. Um, and that tells that's a nice alert for patrons if they are sending in their own request. So if you had any custom instructions for them, you can add it here and it will show up every time they try to request something. Okay, going to go even further with this. We're still really far up on the participant record. There's a number of fields to go. Um, there is your address. This is the second most important thing that I asked. It's actually probably the first most important thing. The days to request um, is probably second. You want to make sure that your contact information is always up to date. Um, so you can't change this right here, but your ship to, you can. If you wanted the um, address contact information updated, then you can reach out to me and I can make adjustments on the administrative side of the system. But your ship to, you can change anything there. Um, route schedule. Some libraries will put that they are on the courier system and what days they are delivered to, and that will print out on the book strap. For contact, you always want an interlibrary loan contact. You have a phone number and an email. At minimum, you should have an email address in there so that when libraries are trying to find your information either on the request or um, in the lookup library information page, there will at minimum be an email, hopefully a phone number so that they can reach you. Um, there are some other fields that you can fill out. Uh, most places do not have alternate pickup locations, so you don't need to add that. And you can also add um, any shipping options you want. These will show up in the lookup library information field. We also have some additional contacts. And then we have the holiday dates. You'll see we have a lot of holiday dates. I went in in January, as is my tradition, and I put in every state holiday so that because we will not be processing on those days and I don't want people's requests to sit, I will put in any staff vacations that I know of ahead of time and anything that may impact our courier deliveries. So this is where you want to put if you are closed. So let's say you're closing for a holiday or you're closing for a week. So you can go on a very well-deserved vacation. You would put the start date and the end date. And in that period, you will not receive a single interlibrary loan request so that you do not have a pile waiting when you get back and so that the requests don't go to you just to sit. So I send out reminders every summer and every holiday break. Well, I'm better at summers, usually holiday breaks for school libraries to please use these for summer breaks so that your requests don't go to schools and hang out there. Um, if you ever do have requests that look like they're sitting an awfully long time, let me know and I will look into them and see what I can do to move them along. But the holiday dates is the, we'll say, third most important setting in your participant record because it tells people when you are closed and it tells the system not to send you requests at that time. Um, you don't need to worry about the external communications unless you use a second interlibrary loan system. So that's mostly academic libraries. Um, you, can, you can store your usernames and passwords in here if you want. I do not. Um, and then this is other related information. So this will display on your information page in Clover. It's um, not something that people will see unless they're logged into the system. And we don't have anything in there. You can put your hours open if you want another place to update those if your hours change. And then we get to patron notification. You can set up notifications to go out automatically to your patrons. If you use SIP2 and their contact information is pulled in, or if you put their email address in as the patron contact. And you can set it for any of their requests when they're pending, when they're received, 
they've been recalled, basically any request status, if their request changes, it will send them an automatic email. Like, let's say your patron said, I would like this book. Um, and you go in and it gets, you request it and you put their email address in and it gets received and you mark it as received in Clover. It will send them an automatic email saying their name, pickup location, which will be main library, the title, and that it's been received, which tells them I should go to the library and I should pick up my interlibrary loan. And you can add a custom message to any of these. So it has, um, let me change that back to none. It has all of these different options. You can set up to one, two, three, four, five different patron notifications. And this will tell you where you can set up the subject, who it's from. Um, you can add a CC email. Um, but yeah, you can set up patron notifications there. You can also do staff notifications. So if you don't want to log into Clover every time, every single day to see if you got a request, you can put in your email address here and check off the ones that you want to receive notices so that you say, oh, I need to log in and look at this. So if you receive a request to send out an item, you can be automatically emailed with that information. but it will also give you conditional responses. It will tell you if a item you have borrowed is overdue so that you can reach out to the patron. And it will tell you if the lender has recalled it and would like it back early. But there's a lot of different options for that one. Um, you can specify lender emails so that if you only wanted those, these are requests for you as a lender. And then again, we do not have NSIP, so you can ignore that part. And then this is where you would have um, any online information for your library that you want to display in the information pages. And that giant thing is the participant record. Um, one more button that I am going to point out. Bear with me as I zoom back to the top of the page. You can jump to any of those sections using the buttons at the top, but you don't have to scroll through the whole thing. Um, lending right here is where you would also set your lending policy. Let me click on that. That is where you set how, um, what your loan periods are. So you can check off this. And here's where you'd set any default periods for specific types of items. So if you want your audiobook CDs to be 35 days and no renewals, then it will go out. And if they request a renewal, if this is set to no, that renewal will be rejected automatically. So if you ever get a question from someone who says, we're trying to request a renewal and it keeps saying no automatically, um, you're going to want to take a look at this just to see if maybe that renewal was set as no on accident. But I'm always happy to go into that in more detail too. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. That was a vast amount of information to throw at you because there are a lot of different settings in there. Um, I do have a YouTube tutorial that kind of skims through it a bit faster. I think it's about two and a half minutes and it just points out the three sections that you should most definitely look at um, to make sure your settings are up to date. And do you have any questions? Uh, Tenzin asks, when requests are unfilled and has notes saying try a particular library and you couldn't find that library when searching again, how can you move forward? Um, it should show up unless the system is being finicky. You can always reach out to me 
and we'll see if we can find it. And if not, you can also add a note that says can't find it and state colleges specifically. Oh, and sometimes they're not available. Um, when you get those, just let me know if you can't find it. Um, and I will see what I can do and see if we can just um, override and send it over to them. Josh. Yes, sorry. Um, when I was being trained very briefly <laughs> when I first got this job, I was told to put two weeks for the request. What is that term you use? The, you know what I'm saying, trying to remember. The time, you know, it has like a default time. I can't hear. What happened? Sorry, I muted myself while I was drinking my water. Oh, for there's. <laughs> Let me show you the, the screen again, because I know what one you're talking about. I knew you there, there, there is the days to respond, which is how long it will sit with you. And then there is days to supply. And that is how long an item will be in shipped before moving automatically to not received. No, I, I meant when you... Um... I can't think of the. Hold on. Okay. I can't find it, but you know when I'm filling out a, a request. Oh, the need by. Need by that's it. need by date. Um, so I it shouldn't be it shouldn't be two weeks, right? That's not good. I mean, if you set it for two weeks and it's not filled in two weeks, then it's not going to go to any other libraries. It will move into right. expired. See, I never realized that, so that's good to know. Yes, and I don't think it usually takes two weeks for a request to be filled, but every once in a while, there's that one that just takes a while. Yeah. Um, the other problem is that if you set it for two weeks and it ends up at a library that maybe has their days to respond set as four and then only processes one day a week, it's going to sit with them for a while. Right. And then, um, yeah, since we're closed on Wednesday, I mm -hmm. I was just checking. So our our days are the check days are Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Mm -hmm. Should Wednesday be checked also, even though we're closed? No, or is that... you can leave that unchecked. Oh, okay. um, just I would make sure your days to respond matches the number of days that you're processing. OK. Thank you. Yeah. OK, let me see. Chat. Uh, Eric said. Hey. Oh, a blank request with the library's code manually entered into the lender list. That would be one way to send a request directly to um, a lender. Yes. And the library code. Yeah, if you wanted to find a library's code, there's a couple of options. Um, if you are in ILL admin, yeah. you go under lender. Way down here, there is search library information. And you can look it up by code or you can... Apparently, I looked up Pearson, so you can look it up by name, and it'll give you the code right there. Um, another option is if you have a Clover window open, click log in, you will actually find everyone's code is right in this list as well. Yes, and Kat pointed out that enter will not work for the search. You have to click submit in the search library information. That is true, and it is very annoying because I always hit enter, and then I sit there, and I wait, and I think my internet is broken. And it's not. You just have to actually click the submit button. So, yes. Um, and this also is where you would see all of that information that you just entered into your participant record. It's got the code, the name. It has the days to respond. 
Um, and it also even has the days requests are processed. Preferred lender lists, which are wonderfully hyperlinked, so you could just click on them. Um, default lender, system wide, no blocked lenders, and all of the contact information. So it has that interlibrary loan email address. And they do not have any vacations planned just yet. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, this is where all of that information that we just scrolled through shows up. I don't think that should show. Yeah. Stop sharing. All right. Are there any other questions? I guess not. Um, before I forget, I will let you know that the next round table is in May. It is Thursday, May 9th. It will be on Teams and it is one to three in the afternoon. And the main topic agenda item for that meeting is going to be the best practices document before the meeting with at least two weeks notice. Um, I am going to be sending out any suggestions that I have had received for changes to the best practices and a reminder to everyone to please review it. And then we will spend that meeting debating, adding, discussing, and maybe we'll have a complaint section. Um, but, and hopefully there will be no alarm testing that day. Um, if you do have any other items that you want added to the agenda, I will send that out in the next email as well. And is there is there any other agenda items anyone wanted to have added today? We still have a half an hour in this meeting. So you can either have a half an hour back or we can find some more topics. Oh, Riley said, thanks to all lending libraries that make ILL so interesting. We should celebrate our success. We should. Our August meeting is going to be in person. Maybe we will have cookies. Cookies are always a good celebration. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. <laughs> okay. So I will send out a summary of this meeting and the recording link um, and start prepping things for the best practices meeting and all and um, the roundtables are also on our wonderful CE calendar that is newish this year and just delightful and much better than Evanced. Um, so they are there if you ever wanted to add those to your calendar, but Otherwise, you will hear from me on the listservs again. And have a, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, April. Thank you.